Scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 11, and I'm going to start at verse 7. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king, kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the word of God for us this morning. And Jason, I forgot to tell you, keep that scripture ready for us. Um, this is the, the passage of Scripture where Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He's entering Jerusalem uh, for the last week of his life. During Lent, we've kind of been following Jesus in his last hours on that Thursday and Friday night. Uh, Friday, he dies uh, on the cross. And we kind of have to rewind a little bit um, to get back to that Sunday before then when he enters into Jerusalem to the crowd that is cheering and, and celebrating his entry into Jerusalem because it's a week-long celebration they have of Passover uh, to remember when uh, God led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And so they're going to be celebrating that in Jerusalem. And, and the Jewish people from all over the world are coming uh, in order to celebrate that. And they're excited that Jesus is there to celebrate with them. And for us, we call this Holy Week. It starts on this Sunday and it ends next Sunday with Easter and that celebration. And it's a week that we focus on the life and the death and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so I want to encourage you this week to really take time to reflect um, what it means that he died on the cross and, and what does it mean that the tomb was empty? How does that change everything uh, for us in our lives? And uh, definitely encourage you to be here on Thursday night at 6.30 uh, for that special Passover service and then at the First Presbyterian Church on Friday at 7 o'clock uh, for the Good Friday Cantata. Uh, just as a time to, to focus and, and remember more of that celebration. Then be here next Sunday. Uh, we'll have all three services uh, Easter morning as we celebrate uh, the empty tomb of Jesus. But it starts all with this uh, entry into Jerusalem. As Jesus is riding on a donkey, he's coming in, they're waving the palm branches, they're putting cloaks and, and branches down on the ground, kind of a, a red carpet welcome for the people to come in, and they're shouting, Hosanna. And so I want us to shout, since we are rowdy, we're going to shout Hosanna, okay? So uh, I'll say Hosanna, and then you just repeat back, Hosanna. Hosanna. Yeah, pretty good. You guys, everyone did really good this morning. I think it's been a rowdy morning. That I thought I'd have to encourage you to get a little louder. Um, but that was pretty loud. You can be louder, and we're going to stand now and shout it. To really, to really get it out, I want to hear everyone in the back. Uh, Jason, though, can you pull up that, that scripture? We're going to shout exactly what the crowd shouted. So um, can you go back one more slide? So we'll start with Hosanna, and we'll go to the end there. And so just shout out what that crowd was shouting as Jesus entered Jerusalem. Ready? Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Next. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. You may be seated. That is what Jesus encountered as he came into Jerusalem. Crowds of people just standing along this path as he enters Jerusalem, shouting and celebrating. They're so excited that Jesus is there. They're shouting Hosanna. And, and that word Hosanna, I was, I was curious about it and started to look up a little bit uh, about Hosanna. And it comes from a Greek word. You know, the New Testament originally written in Greek, most of it. And so, um, do you know what the Greek word for Hosanna is? It's Hosanna. Uh, there wasn't really an English translation, so they just used the same sounds of the Greek letters and put it into English. So it's Hosanna. And, and that Greek word, Hosanna, actually was taken from a Hebrew word. If you know, the Old Testament was mainly written in Hebrew uh, originally. And so this uh, original Hebrew word of Hosanna, it's only found once in the Old Testament, which kind of shocked me. Uh, but in Psalm 118, verse 25, it says Hosanna. And actually the Hebrew, the, the Greeks, they kind of did the same thing, just taking the sounds, but it was uh, Hoshana. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Hoshana was that word Hosanna. And that word means save me. It's a cry for help. It's a, a call to be rescued. Um, and, and really, it's a call to God. God, rescue me. God, save me. Uh, God, come and, and protect me. Take me from uh, the troubles in this life. Uh, save me is what that cry was. And actually, in the, the original um, meaning of Hosanna was this save me of um, just anybody that's out there. It's kind of a hopeful word. Uh, of anyone that's there, help me, save me, rescue me. And it's like if you fell into the deep end of the pool and you don't know how to swim, you'd be yelling, Hosanna. You'd be yelling, save me, save me, rescue me. And that, I say that's the original meaning because that word kind of changed over time for the Jewish people. And, and after a while, it didn't really so much mean save me um, as a, a hopeful thing, but actually turned into a joyful 
thing. Uh, as in, I see my rescuer coming. And so some translate it to, I mean, salvation is here. Salvation is here. So it's not so much hopeful as it is joyful. My salvation is here. It's like you fell into that deep end again at the pool and you still can't swim. And you would yell, um, save me if you didn't see anyone that was going to rescue you. You know, anyone, come help me, rescue me, save me. But you would yell the new way if you saw the lifeguard diving in after you. You'd be say, still saying, save me, but you see the person that's going to save you is right there diving in the water to save you. So it's not hopeful, it's joyful. My, my rescuer is here, is what uh, you'd be saying as that lifeguard dives in to save you. And so that is what the crowd is yelling as Jesus comes in. Our rescuer is here. Salvation is here. We've been hopeful, we've been waiting, and finally he's here. The Messiah is what they would call him. Uh, that's the one that God was sending to save or, or to rescue the people. The Messiah is here. Uh, and so they were joyful. They were excited. They were going to celebrate that he has come. And, and on the one hand, the crowd was right. Jesus came to save them. Jesus came to rescue them, um, just like he does for us today. Jesus is still our rescuer. It's still in him that our, our salvation is found. Um, but on the other hand, the crowd also missed it. Uh, because this crowd that was shouting Hosanna five days later would be shouting, crucify him. In just five days, their opinion of Jesus changed that much. They went from shouting, Hosanna, my salvation is here, to shouting, away with him, crucify him, get rid of him. And, and there's a lot probably to unpack there of, of what made that change happen. Uh, but a, a major part of it, a, a big key in it all, uh, was that Jesus wasn't what they expected. As they were waiting for this Messiah, this one to come and rescue them, the one to bring salvation to them, uh, there's all these prophecies in the Old Testament. Some of them are very general and, and broad. Some of them are very specific. And so the, the, the people knew all those. And, and the picture in their mind of who this Messiah would be, this rescuer would be, was King David. That was the picture they had in their mind. This uh, mighty warrior, this great leader and ruler, uh, this king was who was going to come and rescue them and, and save them. And in, in the world they lived in, in Jerusalem at that time, uh, the Roman Empire had control of the whole area. And so the picture in their head is this Messiah would come, would overthrow Rome, would take charge again of the promised land and, and lead the Jewish people. And so that's the picture that they had in their mind. And there's many scriptures that, you know, talk about the, the Messiah being a king and, and being victorious and, and being a leader. But um, that's not the full picture. I want to read a little bit more uh, of the full picture of who the Messiah was, was going to be. And this comes from uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. I'm going to start at verse 1. This is what the Messiah should look like. Who has believed on our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root um, out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That doesn't quite sound like a conquering king, does it? Uh, they call that the, the suffering servant. Uh, and Jesus was kind of both of them all wrapped up uh, together. That he came to be a ruler, but not uh, a ruler as the crowd wanted it. Not a king that would conquer an area, but uh, a king that would rule in our hearts. That would touch us in our lives. He didn't want to lead uh, a group of people. He wanted to lead individuals. Uh, that's the way I, I see it. He didn't want to come to be our president. He wanted to become our personal savior our personal leader. And so as the crowd was looking for this king to come and conquer, and as Jesus didn't fulfill those expectations, uh, they pushed him aside. They said, you're not the one we were, work we were waiting for because we expected something different. And they said, we'll wait for the next one. And, and they pushed Jesus aside. They crucified him uh, on that tree and laid him in a tomb. And so I want us to, to think about those things. And as I was... Um, Thinking about this Hosanna and, and going to the deep end, I was reminded of the movie San, The Sandlot. Have you all seen the movie The Sandlot? Do you remember that one? Uh, about a bunch of little boys that play baseball together in their neighborhood and uh, have a great time in the summer. And uh, one of the scenes, they go to the swimming pool. 
And they go to the pool to get out of the heat, you know, of that, that hot summer. But they also go because of Wendy Peppercorn. Uh, she was the cute lifeguard that sat up on that chair and kind of teased the, the boys as they were swimming. And uh, they all had crushes on Wendy Peppercorn. Uh, but her beauty was so intimidating, they couldn't even talk to her. Um, but Squints got an idea. Squints was one of the nickname of one of the characters. He had these big, thick glasses. And he came up with a plan. Didn't tell anybody, but he came up with a plan. And he got out of the pool, walked down to the diving board, stepped to the edge, I think he took off his glasses, and jumped into the deep end. But Squints can't swim. And so Squints just starts to sink to the bottom of the deep end. And all the friends are screaming and yelling for help. They're trying to, to get someone's attention. And uh, lifeguard Wendy, she sees this happen. She dives in, uh, pulls him off the bottom of the pool, and gets him out on the side and starts to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And everyone is gathered around waiting to see if Squints is going to make it, if he'll pull through, if he'll be saved. And all of a sudden, he smiles. <laughs> and then he kisses Wendy Peppercorn as she tries to save him. And she didn't appreciate that. She grabs him by arm, throws him out, and says they were banned for life from the pool uh, because of that incident. I don't recommend anyone doing anything like that. Um, but I was th wondering, though, if when Squints dove in there, and what would have happened if the male lifeguard had jumped in to save him? <laughs> you know? Uh, actually, in the movie, I watched it just this week, the, the, the clip, and uh, a male lifeguard pulls him out of the pool, but then Wendy gets out and gives him the mouth-to-mouth -mouth reception. What would have happened if that male would have tried to start saving him? Uh, would Squints have miraculously and quickly recovered? No, I'm fine, I'm fine. Or would he have waved him off? No, no, not you. I need her to save me. Uh, I want her to save me. Uh, I wonder what he would have done if that male, he wouldn't have been happy, I don't think, if that male lifeguard had tried to save him. But I was thinking about that because I think that's what this crowd did. 2,000 years ago. Jesus had come. They said, hey, our salvation is here. They, they looked at Jesus, but then he wasn't quite what they expected. He wasn't what they planned. And so they waved him off. And they said, no, we want to be saved a different way. Our salvation should come another way. Jesus is, is not the right one. That's, that's not what we want. And that's what they did to him. They had their plans. They had their expectations. They had their terms of how they should be saved. And that's what they were looking for. That's what they wanted, not what Jesus brought to them not what God had sent. And, and I wonder if we don't do that same thing still today. That's really probably not a question. We still do that same thing today. God comes to us. God wants to lead us uh, in a path of discipleship. God wants to lead us as his followers. He wants to be our personal leader. And many times we wave him off and we say, no, no, uh, this is the way that I should be saved. This is the way that salvation should come to me. This is the way uh, I should be following you, not the way that you tell me. Uh, and, and don't misunderstand my uh, talking about salvation. Um, a lot of times we kind of think that's a one-time event, but as Christians, salvation is an ongoing process. Uh, we also call it our discipleship process, but it's, it, it go, comes over time, not just a one-time thing. We're always trying to grow to, to become the image of Christ that, that God has put into us. Um, so that's what I mean by salvation. It's an ongoing process uh, that God wants to lead us down as we grow into his likeness. And, and so, so many times God is leading us down that process. He's, he's leading us in discipleship and we'll say, no, that's not really the way that I want to, to have salvation. That's not really the way that I want to be a Christian. I have, and I don't know if we say I have a better idea, I have an easier idea. Um, and I say we because I know I do this too, you know. I get inspired, I, I get excited about something, God's teaching me something, I'm shouting Hosanna, I'm, I'm excited, and then and I really don't want to change though. I don't really want to put in the effort to do that. Uh, and maybe we just lose our inspiration, maybe we just uh, talk ourselves out of it, you know. Well, it's not really rational to be doing those things. Or, or, or maybe we just make excuses, um, Maybe we just ignore it. We, we forget about it. Uh, but there are many different ways that we kind of wave God off. And we say, God, I, I'll do it this way. I have a better way. I have another way. And, and we want to make our own path to salvation instead of following the salvation that's here in Christ. And so I want to encourage you this Holy Week to think about what's the path you are, are on. Where, where are you in that path uh, of discipleship? Where are you in that path of growing into Christ-likeness that God has called us to? Uh, the leadership of this church believes that, that our path is, um, goes with our vision to be a church where you see Christ, that our path is through service, um, through experiencing Christian community in small groups, and through embracing Christ in worship, whether that's personal worship in our prayer time or whether that's worship on Sunday mornings together. 
And we need to be taking those three steps, those three ways down the path in order to be growing in our faith. And uh, a lot of times those are even ways we say, oh, I don't really need that. Uh, I got a better way. I'll take another path. Uh, when Jesus says, this is the way I want you to go. I want you to be passionate about worshiping me. Uh, on Sunday mornings with, with other people, but also in your personal life. I want you to be passionate about that. I want you to, to, to just crave Christian community. I want you just to, to want to be with other people and, and to study my word with them because they can help, help us take those steps, give us guidance so we don't get off on our own way uh, of thinking how God wants us to do things. But we do that together, uh, get, hearing advice from wise people that have been there before and, and listening to them. And then by serving other people is becoming humble and regularly uh, serving those around us, showing them the, the love and grace of God. And, and so as we do those things, we're, we're following that path that Jesus has laid before us. Um, and if we don't, we're kind of saying, I got a, another way. I have my own way. And so this Holy Week, just kind of think, where am I in those, that process? You don't have to do all three at the same time. If you're, you have one of them that you're doing, just, just take the next step then. What's the next one? And take the next step. Uh, but where are you in that path? Are you following Christ or are you trying to make your own way? This is the way that's going to work for me. Uh, instead of listening to his voice uh, through his word and, and through the Holy Spirit to, to guide you in those steps. Uh, I encourage you this Holy Week to really take time. Come up to the special services. Be sure and be here next Sunday to, to celebrate it. But come next Sunday with an answer to that. Where am I uh, in this process? Where am I uh, as I follow Christ? Uh, and be ready to just share that, uh, turn that over to the Lord uh, next week. Uh, so I challenge you, I encourage you. Yell, uh, yell Hosanna. Uh, salvation is here. Uh, our rescuer has come. He's come in Jesus Christ. He's laid the path for us. And we are just called to follow after him. It's not easy. We oftentimes have our own ways. We think we can do it. Uh, but if we just turn it over to him and, and allow him to be our king, to allow him to be the one that would lead us, uh, he'll lead us down the right path, uh, the path that will fill our life with peace, uh, with abundance, uh, and with joy. Uh, so I encourage you in that path and pray you continue to, to follow him as we shout, uh, Hosanna. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that uh, Jesus came to Jerusalem. Uh, it wasn't going to be an easy trip for him there uh, this time, Lord, but he still went. He humbly uh, serves us by taking on our iniquities, taking on our wounds, our pains. Uh, he receives those because he is our servant, our suffering servant. But he also is our king. He also wants to lead us. Uh, he wants us to follow him. Uh, not as a king rules a country, but as a king uh, rules a person and, and wants to guide us in, in each and every day of our lives. Uh, Lord, we pray that you help us to, to look at where we are. Are we following after you or are we making our own way? Help us to rely fully on you and, and just turn everything to you. As Jesus prayed in the garden, not our will, but your will be done in us. Give us that kind of strength, that kind of courage uh, to praise and, and to bless your name. We pray this on Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.